when I was preparing for the show, so I just did the show um, last Thursday, so about four days ago. I've never done a show before, and I was thinking, how the, how the fuck am I going to do that? <laughs> I've never done that. Um, so I was rehearsing, and I was rehearsing the words that would come out my mouth. And at the same time, I was trying to rehearse the feelings that, that I'd encounter as I went through each moment, like the feeling of just before it, the feeling a day before it, the feeling of the, the moment, the, just my feet, footsteps walking to the microphone in front of an audience, then the, then the, then the first word that I would say, how I'd feel about that. It was almost, it was like, like dividing life into seconds and almost rehearsing each second. It's kind of painful. It's, it's dumb. It's, it's stupid, precious to even call it painful. But it's, I was rehearsing the emotions in my gut, how I'd feel about doing, doing all that sort of shit. But I was also rehearsing the words that would come out my mouth. And I noticed just before I went on, I was panicking, I was freaking out, going, what? What, what have I got myself into? I felt like I was about to leap leap off a cliff. Even an hour or two before that, I was, I was putting on my clothes. I was thinking, this is the last pair of underpants I'm ever going to wear. This is the last T-shirt I'm ever going to wear. I felt like I was walking to the, the electric chair and, <laughs> and then life was ending. And and so it was about an hour, 30 minutes before it, I, I sat outside the venue um, just by the train tracks and I thought oh, I can't even remember my first line the first sentence because I thought if I can remember my first sentence everything will flow from that it just it would like just make an indent just fill the room with with the sound of my voice like a balloon and all of a sudden I'd feel comfortable I'd feel like I was present with me somehow in a weird strange dissociative kind of way just to feel my presence with myself to remind myself that I was there with myself. It's kind of weird and strange thing to say, but I think if I can remember that first sentence, I'm going to be okay. But I couldn't remember that first sentence. I was like, oh my God. I practiced it probably 70 to 100 times that the first 15 minutes of my little ramble. And I couldn't even remember the first sentence of it. And I was going, I know what I'll do. I'll crosswire the rehearsing the emotions in my gut with with the rehearsing the the stuff that was going to come out of my mouth, and I was going to say whatever was on my whatever I was feeling at the time, not in a self indulgent way, but just say whatever's be in the room, be present, say whatever's on my mind, and then slowly steer myself back onto the train tracks of all the rehearsed mouth noises that I was that I planned. Up about a hundred times or whatever and it worked I was basically I was just saying any old shit and I and all of a sudden my ears heard my that my mouth was present and all of a sudden I felt present and and all of a sudden I was I was remembering the lines that I was supposed to say and by distracting myself from like hyper focusing on what I was supposed to remember I I peripherally was able to grab it in the same way that you can't see something in the dark by looking directly at it. You have to look at it from the side of your vision. And the show went well. Like, for me, a first go for one hour, I felt like I absolutely nailed maybe 10 to 15 minutes of it and probably the the other 45 minutes, the other three quarters of it. There were there were moments where I thought, yeah, that that's that that's okay, but there were also some flat moments. I felt like it. I could feel. I could hear almost another vo- voice in the back of my head talking to me while I was fronting to an audience. It felt like I was assessing and monitoring and recorrecting constantly, like a tightrope walker. I'm going to guess that even recording these podcasts sort of helped me out doing this podcast for almost two years massively helped to be able just to talk a little bit of shit because this is what these podcasts are they're basically saying whatever's on my mind during the week so I just collect in the back of my head and then just let it out into my little mobile phone I'm sitting out in the back garden today doing that but yeah it was 
it was about letting the feelings out or letting the real stuff out first that were in the way of my prepared stuff and that's that's what that's what like unconstipated my memory and I was able to access it I think I swore too much during the show I reckon it's a bit of an amateur move because but what I discovered I realized later why I probably swore too much it was because by swearing it brought me one second to access my memory to remember the next line and that's something I'm going to have to work on just cut cut back on the swearing because it can be it can be effective but I just yeah I was swearing too much but overall I felt like a, a realness came through there was something that was unexpected I didn't know what or who would turn up on stage that night and it's a derby that I'd never met before I've met him in bits and pieces and dribs and drabs um, but I was surprised, like, I, I totally surprised myself. I was, I was, I was surprised how weirdly comfortable I got after about 20, 30 minutes in. I thought, oh, this is, this is just too easy. I was starting to make up shit and some of the audience loved it, the shit that I was just making up. And I was making up stuff that absolutely fell flat. And I could, I, I kept going back and circling around to the stuff that I'd just made up almost trying to milk it again and realising, no, don't do that. It's kind of disrespectful to the audience. They've, they heard it once. You don't have to try and recreate that weird spontaneous bullshit that you just did 10 minutes before. Brother, who's My brother, who's my harshest critic, he said, I'd nailed the 15, first 15 minutes of the show and then I started to get sluggish and sloppy. And that's, for me, I was... It was probably, weirdly, and I can't believe I'm even saying this, pre-show Derby would not believe that I'm saying this, it was probably because the last three quarters to half of it, I actually got weirdly comfortable. It was like, okay, I'm, I'm in this, I'm in this, com this, is, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever done, and all of a sudden I just got comfortable in it, and that, that was weird, and it kind of shocked me. But the more comfortable I got, the... I guess somehow it's almost like something in me turned off at, and thought, oh, I can just wing this now. A even though I had all this pre-prepared material, part of me, some kind of weird part of me wanted to start ad-libbing almost a lot of it. And I was going, no, just get back onto the poems. I, I regret not reading as many of my funnier poems. Like I'd saved a lot of my funny stuff to near the end and I had to skip them I had to skip about two thirds of the material in the end I realised so I'd over prepared for it and so I'd over cooked it in some ways and so to do another one which it looks like I will I'm going to have to cut out so much of the stuff that I thought I could feel was f just just a flatness and retain the other stuff where I could feel like holy shit, this is weird. It's like the whole, everyone's... At, maybe there was two or three moments in the entire show where I felt like, holy shit, I've got the audience in the palm of my hand. This this, this feels wrong, but so good. <laughs> it felt really good. But it was maybe probably about 10 minutes where that I could feel that over the 60 minutes. And that was, that was, a, tr that was, a, tri that was a weird, trippy feeling. Yeah, it looks like from here I'm going to start working on cutting out a lot of the fat from it. Keep a whole bunch of my really strong stuff near that I missed out on reading. Some some of it was like, ah, oh, damn it. I didn't get to read it. I'll share, I'll share with you something that I, I wrote to an old boss when I worked in advertising for two years. He wrote um, that massive campaign called Dumb Ways to Die for Metro Trains. It was a jingle that went viral worldwide. It's up to like maybe 500 million views or something on YouTube now. But he, John Meskell wrote Dumb Ways to Die and I wrote to him this, um, because I, I loved his public talking. Um, he, he used to do, in the, in the year and a bit, I worked at his agency 10 or more years ago, oh, 15 years ago maybe, it was 2010 or some shit. He, he used to give these speeches and for me they were f more interesting, more funnier, more beautiful than a lot of some of the most famous comedians in the world. 
um, more in, more insightful. But he he wrote me this, so I'm going to read it. He said, "Public speaking. I don't know. I've never had a real problem with it, but I definitely get more anxious the higher the perceived stakes are. The more importance I attach to the outcome, the more anxious I get." I don't have a fear of speaking in public, but I do have a fear of fucking up. The best advice I got was to understand that the audience who have come to actually see you are in no way judging you. They're not watching and waiting to pounce on any mistake you make. They're there with goodwill so you can relax. Also, perfection is bullshit. The best public speakers show their humanity, which means weird pauses, the odd stumble, the occasional misspoken word. Two things about this. The audience actually doesn't know what you intend to say and how you intend to say it. So there's no such thing as fucking up. They don't know you fucked up. It's all in your own head, so don't worry about it. And second, you're a poet and an artist. If you just lose yourself in your words and what they mean, however you present this is going to be perfect. Talk to the universe. Talk to the old man across the road from the venue selling his kebabs. Talk to the dead. Talk to yourself. I guess that's what you're promising anyway. Just be exactly who you are and you'll be great. So he sent me that. It was so generous of him. And I've, it was a mate. Like I, I put that in my document right up the top and read that over and over again to try and brainwash myself with that little bit of encouragement. Um, yeah, he's now in the US. He was working at, like, he was head of McCann Ericsson or whatever for the last 10 years. I think he just quit. But he's the best speaker or most interesting yeah, it's a talker that I'd ever heard in my life. But I wrote down a lot of other advice that I accumulated over the last few months before the show. And there was there was one bit of advice that I found from Louis C.K. He says, say stuff and don't nervously laugh after it. Be like, that's what I said. I don't give a fuck. I really mean it. I love that. I love the idea of not nervously laughing, which is what I what I can do. When I'm in a normal group situation, I just nervously laugh at my at at shit sometimes. I often, and I found myself I didn't do that on stage, which I so I shocked myself with just not not doing that shit. Um, another bit of advice he said was if people applaud, stay in the moment, wear the face expression that says what you were just saying. And Bill Burr says. There's the guy who steps off the bus and they're the guy at 23 and the rest of us who make it in our 40s. <laughs> Bill Burr. Um, there's another one. This is from Tiger Belly Clips I found on YouTube. Improvise for as long as you can without relying on material so you can be in the room. And this is one This one from Ralphie May, who's an American comedian. Pause before punchlines. This is one from Ron Wyatt. He says, of course I don't remember who said it, but one of the old comics said, when you're doing bad, slow down. When you're doing good, slow down. And, so, and he says, so you have to do it slow. The worst thing that can happen is you can start rushing your pace as a comic. That's Ron White. So I'm not a comic, but I know that some of my stuff is funny. A lot of my stuff is a little bit, it's not quite poetry, it's not quite, quite comedy. But all these bits and pieces of advice... Oh, this is another one from Miles Davis. When you hit a wrong note, it's the next note that makes it good or bad. Or the actor or the character from Lost, John Locke, who I loved, everything he did, he moved slowly. Um, and I've always loved that, how slow he moved. I remember I'm re-watching Lost at the moment and for me, that it calms me down. It's like... And I noticed Bukowski, when he does live readings, he 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 was just pausing constantly, and so I was I was ro just thinking I've I've got to be just chill out, re relax, don't go fast. And for me, I managed to do that. Like I managed just to sometimes just just stop and just just take shit in. And not cling to the material that I'd rehearsed. I did. I managed to do that really well, but almost to the point where I didn't get to present everything, which kind of sucked. <laughs> like I'd taken the, this go slow thing probably, and re too much improvisation, probably too literally. Like it was. It helped because I felt like I was I was present and I was in the room, but also I didn't get to deliver some of my 
what I consider is some of my funniest stuff and some of, some of the most viral videos as well I didn't get to re recreate. It was like, ah, oh, bummer. But So I'll, I guess I'm going to work out what I can cut um, and so I can have those video, have those spoken word version of those videos in in my next one. For me, overall, the show went r yeah really well as far as I'm concerned. As for a first go, I was like, oh my god, I I exceeded my expectations. But I know as as something that people pay for, it has has to be probably I can improve improve on it shitloads. I know that like. Just doing one show, I've I've learned so much. I rec I know that I can make it automatically three times better just from the lesson of having done it once. It's it's a that was the steepest learning curve, and you, you're doing it in doing it in real time on on fucking stage. I did have some wine. I had had some glasses of wine before it just to chill out a bit and a, and some wine on stage <laughs> I thought that maybe I cheated the experience just slightly but and that's something that would be probably better I'd be better if I just may, maybe just try to do that without it next time I'll see but yeah it was it was an humble it was a crazy experience it was the weirdest experience I've ever had in my life and and I'm Part of me still, I'm still debriefing from it four four days later, going, "What the fuck happened? Who was who was that guy <laughs> that was on stage?" <laughs> it, was, it was like I was I was an audience in the back of my head watching it, going, "What? Wondering what I was going to do next." It was, it was fucking weird. And I have to add at the end of this, the first time I ever did a public talk was when I was 19 at uni, and halfway through it. I got so anxious, I walked out of it and and said, sorry, I can't do this. And I vowed to myself that day I'd never, ever do a public talk again. So, yeah, I know it's 30 years later and a lot of life's passed. And I've learned to to sort of fake extroversion. It's re it's still real, but it, it just takes shitloads out of me when I do it. So I'm, st yeah, still recovering four days later from intense stage extroversion but it, it was so fun like it, it's fun in hindsight and the last 30 minutes on on stage i was like this this is this is amazing <laughs> i can't believe this is happening and i'm doing it and i'm actually comfortable at one point perhaps too comfortable next time i'll 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 stick a nine rod into me to stop swearing so much and less ramble more poems keep the rambles darby now I'm talking to myself. Keep the vibe. I had good vibe, but more poems. If you like this um, podcast, I'd love if you leave a review for it, left a review for it on Apple or Spotify or wherever you're listening to it. Ta.